Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, webinar for the Instructional Design and Learning SIG for 2020. My name is Janie Sagan, and I am the treasurer, and um, I just want to welcome our first guests for our uh, first webinar. So welcome to A Tale of Two Podcasts with Ben Welk and Ali Prof. You can read more about them in the chat in the link above. But um, I've had the privilege of listening to of attending their um, presentation at SDC Summit last year. And I will say that you all are in for a really wonderful treat as you learn and as you interact with our speakers. And so without further ado, let's welcome Ben Welk and Ali Prof. Thank you very much. That was really yes. cool. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. And um I don't remember if Jamie mentioned it, but I think the microphone rights are available, and we are happy to have discussion. Uh, I don't, we, I don't think we'll use the whole hour, so I think we'll be fine on that. And we're looking forward to sharing our content with uh, with you. So, Allie, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Oh, there we go. Uh, so today's topics, we're going to talk basically what podcasts are about. Um, this is mostly geared towards people who are interested in about podcasts and may or may not have a beginning knowledge about producing podcasts, but they've probably listened to a podcast or maybe not have listened to a podcast. Um, if you are an experienced podcast producer, you might not learn anything new, but you might learn a couple of things in addition to what you already know. Um, we're going to go through what the content is inside the podcast, some tech options, um, we like to be tool agnostic. So what we've done is we've researched like here are things that you can do and then leave it up to you to choose your tool and just discuss a little bit about how you measure success and how you fund it. Awesome. Oh, so, Ben. Uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> Jamie's introduced me and you know, there's enough, enough inf information there, but I'm going to share the story of how we, how I start and why I started the Hope for the Introvert podcast, and that will be later in our program. So back to Allie. Okay, and I am going to share a little bit about my podcast now. Um, actually, kind of my journey. So I've, I got laid off from Boeing when they moved all of their jobs their tech writing jobs from the Puget Sound area to Mesa, Arizona, and I didn't want to move. Um, so I, I found some jobs. I was unemployed. I was doing contract jobs. And I turned to blogging and podcasting as a way to enhance my authority. So I have two blogs that I actually run. One is called Technically Eclectic, um, and the other is called My Au Pair and Me, because as you can see, I've got twins. I actually have three children, um, but we use an au pair as our childcare method. And with my best friend, Maggie, we have a blog to help other au pair host parents. Um, the Technically Eclectic podcast I launched first. I didn't know what to say, so I was like, oh, I'll just read TechCom news. Um, but I found that, um, and actually, let me back up just a little bit. As of July of 2019, I am hired at GoDaddy. I'm a full-time employee writing um, content. So if you go to godaddy.com slash help, that's where I write. Um, and once I got hired, I'm like, you know, I don't really need the podcast anymore. I don't have time for it because I'm trying to run the My Au Pair and Me. Um, for My Au Pair and Me, we are going to launch a podcast. And what we're going to do for that is basically do Facebook Lives because we have a Facebook community group. And we're going to, um, so there's a lady named Marie Forleo, and that's what she does is she has her Marie TV, and then she strips the audio off of that and turns that into her podcast. So that's the podcast that I'm going to be producing next. So um, we can do this either by comments in the chat or like Ben mentioned, you have microphone rights. We would like to know by an unscientific show of hands or um, comments, do you listen to podcasts? Have you created a podcast? This is our chance to get to know you a little bit so that we can give you a better presentation for where you are and what you're, um, what you're trying to learn. So I see Marcia says no, Jamie says yes. Uh, 
that's no, you don't have a podcast, or no, you haven't listened to one. And Jamie, is that yes, you have a podcast, or yes, you listen to them? No, yes, I listen to them. Oh, okay. Have you, no, tried, pro have you tried producing one? No, I have not yet. Oh, it's actually kind of fun. I was th I'm thinking about it, though. Very cool. Yes. Awesome. So we didn't get a lot of participants. Yes. Hi, Marilee. So, um, yeah, it, it sounds like there's obviously there's some interest or you wouldn't have signed up for the webinar today. So I'm assuming I, also that most of you are not podcasting. Um, it is fun, but it is a good deal of commitment also that we'll talk about as we move forward with things. I wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, Ali talked about her podcast. I'm doing, and I know some of you have listened to some of the episodes for me, I'm doing Hope for the Introvert. And I had a friend, gosh, what are we coming up on? A year and a half of doing this now. Um, I had a friend about a year and a half ago tell me I should start podcasting because a lot of people were um, getting content that way. And I had not really considered it because my view of why would anyone want to listen to me? I don't want to listen to me by myself sort of thing. But then we got into the, some, we'll talk more about it in the formatting, but there are different ways that work for different people. And I found that there's a podcast framework that works pretty well for introverts, which was kind of important for what I'm doing. All right, so um, just kind of to follow up on our, oh, <laughs> yeah, no worries, Lynn. Um, so just to kind of follow up, in 2011, no wait, um, because I'm presenting and I'm at home, I don't have my second screen for the notes, but um, there was an actual company and I have the show notes and we can send them out later. Um, but they did do a survey about podcasts and it might have been actually 2016. But anyways, 64% of Americans know about podcasts. 44% of Americans have listened to at least one podcast and 26% of Americans listen to podcasts at least once a month. And I think it was Allison mentioned that her employer might be interested in starting one. Um, there's some definite benefits and drawbacks to podcasts, um, which is, I'm going to actually, instead of going through these one by one, excuse me. So there are a bunch of reasons why you should, oh, and my cat's trying to make a, uh, a guest appearance. So <laughs> just like cats usually do. Um, so there are definitely reasons why you should start a podcast and not start a podcast. And if you'll notice, the first two bullets are pretty much the same reason. So one cool thing about podcasts is that it is a new type of thing. And so um, there's not a lot of, um, the, it's, a, it's not as crowded as some other fields might be. Like, you know, blogs and websites, it seems like everybody has those but not a lot of people have podcasts. And so you would be like one of the first people into your market. But on the other hand, that's a reason not to start your podcast because you're one of the first people into the market and your audience may or may not know to look for you there. It depends on your ideal avatar. Like who are you trying to reach and would they be listening to a podcast or not? Um, also in the survey, they showed that most people between like 20 and 40 listen to podcasts and then next like 40 to 60 after 60 or 70 years old it kind of drops off um children under 12 it kind of you know not a lot of children listen to podcasts and then 12 to 20 it's also kind of in like the 40 to 60 range so um who is your avatar and also interestingly enough men and women listen to to um, podcasts about equally. Um, one cool thing about podcasts, so in the reasons under the column to start, is listener attention. Is that um, if you do videos or you do blog posts, um, if you look at the Google statistics for 
attention for reading the entire, consuming the entire piece of content, whether it's a blog post or a video, like videos need to be really short. They need to be like two or three minutes long, maybe five, maybe seven. But um, some people have podcasts that are seven to 10 minutes long, but some people have podcasts that are 30, 40, 50 minutes long and people are consuming the entire thing. And the benefit about podcasts is people consume the entire content because they can do other things. They're driving or they're walking the dog or they're doing the dishes. Um, another good reason to start a, a podcast is because you have connection with your audience. You have your voice in their ears. And so they're getting to know you. It's more personal than words on a page um, and it's not quite as much production effort as a video. And also video has the visual component. And so again, you tie up people's time and they can't really multitask as well watching the video as they can when they listen to a podcast. Although we all know there's people who will be watching Netflix and being scrolling Facebook on their phone at the same time. Um, and the, oh, go ahead, Ben. No, yes, yeah, so, so we can watch each other as we start to say something here. So I yeah. would say, yeah, the video part's interesting because I've considered it, but at this point I'm still scared of the video part. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing that it could be edited. I mean, part of the issue, part of the good thing also about podcasts is it's not live. So you have time to go back and clean things up and re even restate things occasionally if things were totally not clear. Um, I would say that there is a good amount of commitment to it. And I know for me, a lot of that, and what is one of the things you had to consider is if you're gonna do one, not only how long is it gonna be, but how often are you going to try to do it? Mm -hmm. And I've hit a pace that works for me mainly, unless it gets to be a busy time around holidays and such, but there's a fair amount of time that goes into the editing and it is a commitment. and one thing that I found when I was blogging is that you find that the blog starts to just kind of drive itself. You know, you had to, had to prepare something for it. I'm feeling a little bit of that with the podcast also. I've just released, I think it was episode 30, it's 29 or 30. And it really does, well, I've got to get things set up for the next month, for the next month, for the next month. And I've figured out some ways to get ahead on that a little bit, but there is a lot of, um, you really need to consider it. I mean, there are many, many blogs that you'll see out there that are two or three or maybe five episodes or seven episodes, and then they just stopped because there is a commitment to it and you do have to push forward. Um, we have money listed as a uh, not start reason. The outlay's fairly small. Um, I mean, you'll need a mile, and we'll talk about what the equipment needs are and what you need to do around hosting but it's not a terrible amount of money to do even as kind of a hobby type thing since they're not, they may or may not be self-supporting. Yeah, and that's the reason why money is in the not start, not start column and there's a picture of a sheep is that um, Tim Ferriss was talking about podcasting and somebody gave him the advice of like, you can only, or you can shear a sheep many times, but you can only skin a sheep once. And so you really have to approach, if you are looking to monetize your podcast and earn money from the podcast, um, think of your podcast more like content marketing. And content marketing is not as lucrative in terms of bringing in the sales as uh, direct marketing or digital marketing or things like that. But people buy from people they know, like, and trust. You have to acquire your audience, you have to bond with them, and then you can convert. And so when it comes to the acquire, bond, convert, know, like, and trust, um, podcast is about building that relationship with your audience. It's not, as, it's not going to give you direct sales, but it might improve your sales if you're going to do it for a business reason. Um, oh, go ahead. No, I think that segues into our next slide. Yeah, Actually. it does. But before I do that, um, yes. so back over on the start uh, column, the very last thing is it is totally fine to start a podcast just for your own enjoyment, just like I did when I was unemployed and I was looking to um, kind of build my resume and get into things. It's like, okay, I've heard about this podcast and I'm going to start it. You know, it's something I can add um, as a, oh, what's the word when you're trying, you're, 
how people perceive you. Um, I can't remember. But anyways, well, it's, it's, kind of your, it's kind of your brand. It's... Yeah. And then um, also in the not start column, one more thing before we move on is that the text thing is that even though you have a podcast, um, you still, it still helps to have a website. And at the very least, you have show notes that go with the podcast. So there is some text involved because some people will start a podcast going, oh, it's going to be so much easier than writing a blog post. But, you know, actually not always. Okay. So, yeah, so talking about the money and monetizing. Yes, yeah, so a lot of consideration, like like Ali said, you can certainly just do a podcast for your own enjoyment. And I have friends who do that, and they do it as they work through playing Dungeons and Dragons or other games and just kind of record that and share it. But a lot of it is what value are you bringing? Why do you, why? should people listen to your podcast? And especially, you know, if you're talking about doing it for a company, what connection do you want to build with your brand, with your listeners? And that, that is just the whole thing of how do you get the listeners to start with? But for me, mine was kind of mainly passion or mission driven where I wanted to find ways to connect with people that I could make a difference in terms of introverts and leadership. And I had found through doing live presentations at conferences and workshops that that messaging was really important. And I could see how it was transformational for people to understand that being an introvert was not a handicap. So part of the value I try to bring with the podcast is sharing people's stories of what it's like as an introvert in their workplace or other parts of life and kind of some of the strategies they've had. And that includes, you know, what are the challenges they've faced and, you know, ways they've overcome them. I feel like I'm starting to spout my description of my podcast, but that really is why I'm doing it. So a lot of us think, why, what value are you bringing? And again, so much of this is what's driving you wanting to do the podcast. And I remember the word I was looking for, it's reputation. So I started my technically eclectic podcast to build my reputation. And once I got my full-time job, then it was a lot of work. And so I quit it. And the reason why I'm going to start the My Au Pair and Me podcast with Maggie is that we're starting to really be able to reach and help people on Facebook because that's where a lot of moms are. We're looking at 30-year-old or women who are in their 30s. Um, late 20s to early 40s and we want to be able to reach them when they're not you know trying to scroll the phone at 3 a.m. while nursing a, a six-month-old baby so anyways that's why we will start a, our podcast okay so types of podcasts so we've been talking about my technically eclectic was uh, a single host um, that's up here on the top and then for bins, it's an interview style podcast. And then what we did is we took the covers of a lot of uh, podcasts that are currently out there in the technical writing content space. So we've got the content strategy podcast by Christina Halverson, um, Ed Marsh's content content. We've got Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. And I would say that most podcasts are interview style because it's more interesting to listen to but you don't have to have an interview style podcast. Um, also, the podcasts range in length. Like some of them, like I said before, like 10, 15 minutes. And then I think Tom Johnson has recorded a podcast that was over an hour long and he still gets people who listen to it. Sometimes you have to break it up into chunks, but you know. Oh yeah, and LavaCon, they have a podcast. So Ben, do you want to add anything to this slide? So I guess the thing, the main thing looking at this is there's a lot of variety and there are a lot of reasons that people did these. So I'm looking at the Cherry Leaf, which is now a video podcast, essentially, or a vlog. Um, and Ellis doesn't have guests. He just, he does reviews of things. He talks about things, but all of it is on camera, just him for the entire time. So lots of different reasons and you also see you know there are different motivations around these some of these are obviously business driven where they're trying to reach their customers and establish credibility some of them are done because people just want to be out there doing podcasting um, i do credit ed marsh for a lot of inspiration in terms of 
getting into podcasting at all. So, so I think we can, we'll start moving into some of the nitty gritty around the things. So there are specific requirements around podcasting and a lot of it has to do with where your podcast is going to be covered. Normally you're not just hosting a podcast on your own web host. Um, lots of reasons for that, but one of them is reliability to make sure that it can, that the podcast can be reached. But also what happens is of course you want to be on um, Apple podcasts or Google podcasts or iHeartRadio or any of these other, you know, there are lots of different podcast hosts, but they have requirements around what you'll need. So you have to provide information about the podcast yourself. So you do have to have a cover, just like I look at it like an album cover and a description because the description is important so that search engines can find your podcast. Um, you want to link to your website. Now, one thing that I've done is I do provide transcripts for my podcasts on when the, when the podcast comes out. And that does require more work, but my feeling on it was that I know personally there are times I can read something, but if I'm in an office setting, I might not be able to listen to a podcast, but I can certainly read the content and I can refer to the content later. And again, talking about show types, um, episodic or serial, I probably got a bit of, of a combination of both because of my podcast. I think I've had two that were the one guest for the entire podcast as opposed to breaking it up into a couple of chunks. And one of the reasons I do that is it can take a long time to edit 55, 60 minutes of content and even longer to get the transcript in place. So I have broken it into chunks because of that, but also so it's more consumable for people who need to go out and walk their dog or run an errand or something like that. Shooting for about a 20, 22 minute sweet spot so that people can consume it without having to sit down and dedicate time to it. Right. And so what we have is we have the podcast show um, in general, and then within the podcast show, you have episodes. And when it comes to the episodes, you can have a separate cover for each episode, but the default is to just um, go back to the show cover and there's nothing wrong with that in fact pretty much all of the episodes or all of the podcasts that i listen to because it's such an audio format they don't bother with having an episode cover um if you as a listener to podcasts you've probably already noticed there's usually um, an intro and an outro sometimes outro i haven't sometimes it's o-u-t-t-r-o um, i don't know the exact spelling but um, you have um, sometimes when you have an interview, um, the person will have an intro before they start the interview and then they have the show. And then after the interview is over, then they'll be like, wasn't that a great episode? You know, these are all the things I learned. And um, sometimes let's see, they'll have a call to action in the outro because you're they're trying to move people between mediums. So it's like, oh, yeah, and if you really like this show or if you want the free download that I was talking about in the show, then go to my website. And so trying to get people to transition between the audio medium and the website medium. Um, an ad track having music. Um, you'll notice that a, a lot of times people will have intro music or outro music. Um, not always. It's not required. In order to release an episode, um, the artwork is optional but every episode needs to have some description and most of them say that there's show notes on your website. And like Ben mentioned, um, it's also a good uh, accessibility thing to have, I'm blanking on the words again, transcript. a transcript. Yes, thank you. Um, have a transcript of your episode. And um, when we get into the part of the presentation about the tech of, of the podcast and we'll get into that also. Um, a couple of best uh, practice tips is plan a bullet outload or outline before you start recording, whether you're doing a solo show or an interview show, is that 
you know, you don't necessarily want to type out everything that you say because you don't want to sound like you're reading something. Um, but you also, you want to sound natural. Um, but if you don't have an outline, you might kind of wander. Um, another tip is to do content batching. So like Ben mentioned, he will do a one hour interview and then break that up into two episodes. Um, for me and Maggie, what we do right now with our blog posts that we're gonna start doing when we do our podcast is we do, um, we do our blog posts like once a month, we'll just dedicate one day and we'll, we'll set out the outlines for four blog posts then we'll spend the spend the most of, the rest of the month blah, writing and fleshing them out, and then we release them and we drift them out over the next four weeks. And so, it's kind of hard to get started in the beginning because you're trying to produce stuff right now and produce stuff for the future. But once you can get that content backlog created, so you can start dripping stuff out, it really takes the pressure off. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So our next slide is. What does it look like? Now, some of you, at least on the website, have listened to podcasts. Um, we are pretty, again, we're tools agnostic. We're also platform agnostic. So there, you can listen on a mobile device, iPad, over your computer. Um, I think many of them you can do over Google Home or Alexis or things like that now as well. So there are multiple opportunities and ways to consume the podcast. Sorry, I took a moment. Um, Beth commented, now we're stuck with, or that's what happens when people don't study Latin. Extro becomes outro. Now we're stuck with outro. <laughs> yeah, we probably are. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just you know, showing you the difference between this is what the show looks like, and then this is what an episode looks like. And you, know, you can scroll up and down, um, but for the purposes of screenshots, that's an example. So let's talk about how a podcast gets published. Um, so if you're interested in creating a podcast, basically you create your content strategy, you create your content plan, your content calendar, whatever you wanna call it. Um, you record it, again, batching is really good. Oh, I think, yeah, and then, um, as Ben mentioned, he's going, he does more editing. Um, when Maggie and I do, or when I did my Technically Eclectic, I did less editing because I figured it was kind of more natural sounding. Um, Maggie and I are going to be releasing our Facebook Live, so it will be very unedited, which will save me time. But it's also, we're reaching a different audience with a different purpose. Um, then after you edit it and you have the mp3 file done, oh and also um, a lot of the shows will use the same bumpers and so what's really nice is that you'll, you can have your mp3 intro bumper, your mp3 outro bumper, then you record your show and then you go into your sound editor and we've got a couple in the text section um, and you, you put the three and then like maybe you overlay your your music track on top and you put all of that together and you create one audio file. Once you have your final episode file, then you upload it to your host and you can schedule the release date in the host. So you can upload two, three, four, ten episodes at once and then drip them out, kind of like Disney did with The Mandalorian. Like they had everything ready to go and then they dripped it out. Um, on the other hand, you can do like what Netflix did with The right. Witcher and you can be like, here's the entire season all at the same time. And you can just dump everything out. So you choose your release schedule. And then what happens is all the players, they pick up the RSS feed and then they'll update. And then as a circular thing, you keep measuring. Awesome. Okay. So Ben, how do you so, record your audio? Recording, there are multiple options out here and it's not overly complex, but it's a little bit more complex than I expected to be. So in talking to Ed Marsh, doing my homework before I started doing the podcast, I thought, well, can't you just use Skype? Because that seemed like the obvious thing. But what you run into is that you have to decide, do you want one file that you're working off of, where if you've interrupted your guest several times, which I managed to do 
at, on some of my podcasts, you've got that one file, you can't really do anything to fix that. Um, I use a service called Zencaster, and Zencaster basically works through your browser and it uploads a file, a WAV file from me, it uploads a separate WAV file from my guests, and then when I do my editing magically, I'm no longer talking over the guest. So it allows you to slip things sideways a bit. So again, mics are, wait, I've headset on there first. So headsets, sorry, there's a mic. The recording mic, various prices. I paid about $90 for my Blue Yeti and actually got a deal on it because it was packaged with Assassin's Creed or something like that. And it was cheaper to get it that way through a game store than it was to just buy the mic by itself. And there are li there's a little bit of peripheral equipment, which we I don't think we really talk about very much, but you also need devices that will actually stabilize the mic. And I'm gonna try to drag this over and I will probably break it totally. But you can see that I've got this hanger thing here, which is something that's uh, kind of takes care of vibrations and things like that. And I have a filter in front of it, which is called a pop filter to try to catch some of the puzz and tuh sounds and things. So there are some pieces that you get. Uh, one thing that's really important, you can control the quality of what you're using for the recording. You have very little control over what your guest is using. And if a guest is not using a mic, it can be pretty apparent because the room sounds different. So there's a case of some minimum equipment that's needed, but again, I don't think the outlay was very much and it was a good excuse to get a nice pair of headphones and to get the mic. And I use the mic now, for instance, for the webinar that we're doing. Um, you can still use Skype, you can use other online tools, um, or you can record directly to your computer and or your guest can, computer. Yeah, and I bought a used ATR2100 for like $35, but I did spend, so the boom arm is about 20, then you have the vibration mount, which is like 10, and the pop filter, which is like 15. So you can definitely get everything for under, you, under 150. Um, just, and the other thing that I wanted to say is that it's most important what you sound like. Your guests need to be odd, audible like you can't have them so echoey that they're unintelligible but it's less important what your guest sounds like than what you sound like as the host especially when you're doing your intro and your outro so then when you go to edit it um and i'll let ben add on at the end with what he uses so there's um, a couple of free options so you can have garage band for mac users and audacity um, audacity works for both mac and windows for paid, there's Adobe Audition. Um, and so that's what you do. I actually, I didn't put it in this slide, but I know of people who use Snagit, oh no, not Snagit, Camtasia. Um, Camtasia. Yeah, TechSmith. Um, and what they do is they'll record the video and then they'll strip out the audio. And the biggest thing is you need to be able to look at that WAV file or the file with like the sound and you can, um, cut out the ums and the ahs. And then here's a little trick, also not on the slides, is that sometimes when I'm recording myself and I I flub a word or make a mistake or whatever, sometimes I'll clap really sharply next to the mic and it'll make a, a definite um, visual. It's a marker. I can, yeah, I can visually see. And then when I'm going back and I'm editing the audio, I can see the, the spike and be like, oh yeah, there's a, a part I need to make sure that I edit out. So once you have the file edited, then a phonic and levelator, what those do is that when you have your intro, your outro, um, and your main show, and even when you're talking, if you're doing an interview and you have got your sound and your, um, your interviewee's sound, what these two programs do is they create a little bit of a, or they kind of equalize the sound level. So you're not turning it up for the interviewee and then being like, oh my gosh, but Ben is too loud. Oh, no. but his guest is too soft. And so it just kind of levels that all out. Right, so, and 
I'm, I'm using Adobe Audition. I'm using it because um, I'm at a university and we have Creative Suite and Audition is included in Creative Suite, so I didn't need to purchase it. Uh, but that also, it provides templates so that there's a podcast template and their voice types like a podcast voice. You can um, hone it for male or female and you can do all of that leveling within the program itself. And it's, there is a little bit of complexity to it, but most of the, what is finding the things like Ali said, you, you know, putting that clap and putting a marker because you know there's something you need to pull out and, and pull out and edit for whatever reason. And there are plenty of times I mispronounce whatever it is I'm trying to do or my guest does. And we've joked around how I really need to have, an, have outtakes on some of the podcasts because we started laughing so much because we've screwed up the content so many times trying to talk about it. Um, you also have the option of hiring a podcast engineer. And I don't have solid rates around that. I do know that my hosting provider offers the service and it is around $2,800 per podcast. So that is well outside of any budget I ever had in mind for this. So I'm doing the editing, it's more time intensive, but it's actually been fun because Audition is, if you've used any Creative Suite tools, the tools, the toolbars look the same. Some of the tools look about the same. And they're little paint tools and marquee tools and all sorts of things like that. They work just like other things in um, Creative Suite. Yeah. And um, you can look on common sites that I hear of for hiring people like Upwork and Fiverr. But I also know that there's a growing field of people who are VAs or virtual assistants who help with podcasts. Um, there's one, oh, Pat Flynn, F-L-Y-N-N. -N. He has a podcast. Um, he's got Ask Pat and he's got the Smart Passive Income. But he has a YouTube channel where if you want to learn how to use GarageBand or Audacity, um, he has free YouTube videos, how to set everything up. He also has a paid course. Um, which is somewhat expensive, but he has tons of really great free resources on YouTube. Okay, so then host. So you've, you've used your microphone, you've recorded, you've gone through Audition, Audacity, GarageBand, you've, you've got your MP3 file, now what do you do with it? So now you upload it onto your host. And Ben? Sure. And so there are a lot of options out there. And with the first episode of the podcast, I decided I would use Amazon Web Services and create my own hosting for it. And that did not last very long because it was like, oh my gosh, people are downloading this. What am I going to do to make sure it's always available? So I did high, um, sign on with Blueberry as a host, um, which is costing me $12 a month um, for the level of podcast content that I'm doing for the number of number of hours basically. But there are a bunch of different hosts and the key thing is that it may be absolutely fine to use any kind of a regular hosting provider, say you have a WordPress blog like I do, but you need to make sure it is better to use probably a dedicated podcast host because they the pipes are big enough. They're big, they're ready to support multiple podcasts. And what I liked about Blueberry, and I don't have experience with the other ones, but what I liked about Blueberry is a WordPress plugin. And I essentially just create a pot, create a post like I would always do, except this time I kind of click the fact that I, for my um, category type, it's a podcast. And then that allows me to upload, you know, to link to where the podcast is, up, podcast is uploaded on Blueberry. Lots, yeah. lots of options. And I started out with Libsyn because they're one of the original podcast hosts, and so they've been around for a while. Um, but then I'm switching to Buzzsprout because the pricing structure is a little bit uh, more simple. Um, the other piece of advice that I have is don't actually buy a host until you've actually got like two or three episodes ready to go like record two or three episodes to start with. Um, I got really excited. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my account and I'm going to get everything set up. And then life happened and it took me like three months before I released Technically Eclectic. And that was three months of paying for a host that I wasn't using. 
So if I had it to do over again, I would have waited to actually get my host um, until I was ready to release. Right. Uh, and I and so. I op and I recorded three podcasts and launched with the three podcasts. The other thing mm -hmm. you'll find is even though they have monthly um, upload size limits, typically when you sign on with the most with a host, they will import whatever your entire content library is in that first month. So it definitely makes sense. You, plus, you want to know, as Ali says, you want to get some under your belt because things take, for most of us, take take longer than we expect to. So I think it's a good lesson there. Yeah, the learning curve is always <laughs> a steeper in the beginning. Um, but when you do, so it's not going to be an overnight thing. So once you get your host and you create your account and you're going to populate a few initial things like what is your content area like are you health and wellness or are you parenting or are you tech and um, marketing or whatever um, then what you do is and some of the so like I know Buzzsprout will automatically request for you to have access to the players but the players are separate entities than the host so you have your mp3s uploaded to your host but you still have to go out to iTunes, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, um, anywhere you want your podcast to be heard. And you have to request for your pod, you, you have to create an account and request them to pull the feed from your host. So your file you only upload once, it goes to your host and your, it's, it's kind of like, um, like a status update is that it just creates a flag that says, oh, there's a new podcast. Oh, there's a new podcast. And then the players, they they see that flag and they list it on their player. But when the player plays it, whether you play it on iTunes or you play it on Google, it's still pulling the source file from your host. Does that make sense? It does to, it oh. does to me, so. Yeah, okay. Um, I just took a break to look at the comments. And so Michael says Camtasia is great, but editing sound for breathing, et cetera, takes lots of time. And Ben will attest to that. And yes, it does. Um, so it takes one to three days for your player to connect to your host. So it's pretty instant for you to set up your host and upload your files and they're there, but it takes one to three days to establish a new podcast on a player and then in the future, once you have your podcast established, it can take up to 24 hours for your new episode to show in the player. So let's say Tuesday night at 9 p.m., I upload episode number eight. Well, it might not be when, until Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time, 9 p or 9 a.m. Eastern. You know, there's, it just, it takes a while. So it takes up to 24 hours for a new episode to publish, and it takes one to three days for a new podcast to publish. Great. Oh, and also, that's what I was gonna say on the last slide, is every host has the ability to um, embed a player into your website. So if you have a WordPress site, then you can embed your podcast straight from your host into your website and remember the transcript. Okay, great. So, yeah, so in terms of episodes, these are examples of episodes. Um, really, um, yeah, this is uh, an interview of Janine Rowe, who is a colleague here at RIT, and this is back in my first couple of months of doing the episodes. But one thing that I've done is I actually provide a pre-podcast questionnaire for my guests and talk about the main topics we're going to cover since we are since the podcast is pretty purpose-driven, but also what additional things would we like to do. So each episode there'll be an intro, and this is a lot of on on the website there'll be a section of key so concepts, things that are quotable. There's a nice little plugin that allows you to just kind of create ready-made tweets. Um, there is a new um, audio plug a plugin, new service offered through um, Blueberry. I don't remember the name. It's something Burst, but it does little audio bursts of your podcast also. I haven't really started doing too much with those, but all sorts of things that you can do these little pieces of things to promote your podcast. Um, 
my transcript te, right now i'm using a service called temi.com it's running me 10 cents a minute on a podcast to get a transcript it takes some time to edit the transcript and i know i have not figured it out yet but, or checked it yet but the newest version of android there is a google record on there now and i'm going to check and see if that is something i can leverage as well to produce a transcript other things, I try to provide interesting facts about things, and I encourage my um, guests to help promote the podcast. Now, Janine's interesting because as far as I know, she has still never listened to these podcasts, even though they were recorded a year ago. So I do have this challenge of interviewing introverts who aren't very willing necessarily to promote themselves. The other thing is that we have a thing on there about swag, and I, here's an example of a glass mug they're using zazzle to produce the things and we're actually going to do a drawing and one of you all will get a mug that says hope for the introvert and introverted leadership on it but in general i wanted to make the swag available i give i always give something to my guests to thank them for their time and i've made things available and i know jamie you've purchased one of those mugs yourself as well so it's nice to have the I don't know, paraphernalia around the podcast as well. And part of that's starting to build the brand and build the recognition. Yep. And then uh, finally, every podcast player gives you analytics. Um, also, you have Google Analytics that you can embed on your um, website. So if you want to embed your episode into a website page, um, this is an example from Ben's. Um, the analytics that he gets from Blueberry. So you can see it's kind of small. I didn't make it big enough to show you, but just to give you an idea that there's, you know, the total number of downloads and you can see trending day to day, how many um, downloads you had and then the distribution, mobile, web, podcast, pod catchers, um, and then your geographic area. So where are people listening from the United States, from Canada, from Mexico, from Europe? Um, oh. Before I do that, Ben, did you want to add anything? No, one thing I would say is that I think the, for me, I was very much tracking, tracking the analytics and I still look at them often because, and that 4,051 total downloads is all of the podcasts together. I'm not, have not achieved the thousands of downloads per episode. They are averaging over around 120, 130 a piece. So I know that there are listeners out there, but I was, I'm not paying as close attention to it now, but man, when I first was getting towards that first thousand, I just kept watching it and watching it and what's it gonna take to push it over. So I'm sure I'll be doing that as we get close to 5,000 as well. Um, what's interesting about Blueberry is they provide the podcast statistics. There's a service regardless of who your host is. So you could still leverage their um, analytics as well. And Google yeah. Analytics to measure the actual visits to your website. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's cool. All right. And so the biggest, when it comes to measuring success, and then we just have monetization, and then we need to leave time for Q&A. Um, but when it comes to measuring success, first you need to define success. Like, what is your goal? When I did the Technically Eclectic podcast, I was doing it for fun and to build my reputation. So I wasn't really trying to build an email list. I didn't have really good calls to action. Um, you'll hear a lot of, you know, thinking about the podcast that you listen to. Um, you'll hear people doing call to action, like please leave a review on iTunes or whatever it is. And then what are you trying to do? So are you trying to reach people? Are you trying to affect sales? Are you trying to just get people saying, oh, you know what? I heard your podcast and it really made a difference. It was really inspiring. Um, and a lot of the um, success metrics that you can use, if you use content marketing metrics, a lot of the metrics that you use for content marketing, if you're doing it in a business setting, you can use for your podcast because podcast is content marketing, an element of. Ben? Don't have a lot to add around that. Um, I said mine is mainly mission and passion driven. Quite honestly, I was happy to have anyone listen to the podcast. Um, but 
in general, yeah, you'll have to decide what is your goal. Now, high volume podcasts, they'll be in the hundreds of thousands likely per download. I haven't really even tried to push to that. To me, this is something I'm doing on top of my day job and my volunteer leadership responsibilities in a couple of organizations. So I've scoped my podcast growth probably around what I can actually manage. But again, determine your goal ahead of time. If for me, it's primarily making a difference. So let's take a quick look at the next slide, which is on how do you fund your podcast? Oh, I forgot oh, some bullets. Oh, some stuff didn't <laughs> pop in, okay. Lead quality, sales, web traffic. So these are con um, typical content marketing metrics. Okay, so podcast funding. And then that's the last slide. So as Ali mentioned, startup costs were around $150. Uh, my startup costs are probably a little bit more than that, not much, probably around 200. And then I've got a monthly $12 a month for the hosting provider, $20 a month for Zencaster, and then 10 cents a minute for podcast. So it's running me what, 30 ish dollars a month to run the thing. Now I've not aggressively gone out and sought sponsors. I do have um, sponsorship available to me through Patreon. And I do encourage my um, listeners to visit Patreon and that's where you can pledge a dollar or two dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever you would like to pledge with it. But that is one way to support the podcast is through crowdfunding. Um, I also get a little bit of money if someone buys my Zazzle products. And Ali, I know that you're planning on doing some productization with your au pair podcast as well. Yes, with my au pair and me, um, before I launch my podcast, first I need, so Maggie and I have started the blog. And actually, if you go out and you search my au pair and me, you can see the, the blog. And then right now what we're doing is we switched email providers. So I need to get email forms set up so we can get our email list. And I've actually started a store where we have downloads and the PDFs are free, but we're going to charge um, for the Word document. So for instance, if you have a new au pair coming in and you're like, oh, I need a family manual. Well, we can give you a PDF blank one that you can fill in or you can spend like 10, 15 bucks and buy the Word version that you can completely fill out and customize on your own. And so after I get the, uh, so step one, create a blog, done. Step two, we're doing the email list, and step three, hooking up the store. And then once I have the email list in the store, that's the most important because I need an income stream first. Because like Ben said, you know, we're paying for website space and hosting and things like that. And then once I have the store up and running, then I'm going to launch the podcast. And also then I'll have a little bit of analytics to see does is the podcast like maybe indirectly affecting our sales. And just like Ben said, his podcast is a, a effort of passion. And Maggie and I are doing our blog as kind of a passion too. And we've already received people um, messaging us saying, wow, I really appreciate your, um, your blog post on rematching because that really helped me. I had to go into rematch with my au pair. And so that's what we're going for. Um, and again, I also might have a, a Patreon type link so people can donate, but um, this is not going to replace my full-time job at all. It's more, I'm doing it because I wanna help people. And I believe that podcasting is a way to reach people more personally, but without the effort of video. Um, yeah, and I just wanna make a difference in the world. So, if you would like to unmute and ask us questions, or you can also drop questions into the chat. And are there any questions that you guys have? No, I, I currently don't have. I currently don't have any questions. I mean, y'all pretty much covered this in great detail. I think it's just you know, as you actually go through the process, that's probably when we'll have. Questions. <laughs> yes, and you can always message us or email us. Um, we've got our emails here on the final screen. Um, I haven't done anything with Technically Eclectic for a while because I've been putting all of my extra energy, you know, balancing work and being a mom 
and the Myopair and Me site. So um, I haven't done much with Technically Eclectic lately, but it's okay. That's you can okay. Still reach me, Ali at Technically. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Beth Agnew here, and I just Hello. want to thank you both for a great, rich, value-packed. Uh, session. I really got a lot out of it and uh, I really appreciate it. There are a couple of little points that I missed, but you guys are recording this, right? Will we have access to yeah. the recording later? Yes, we're going to send yeah. the recording to, of, the, of this webinar afterwards. Uh, Vicki usually sends that email along with a link to the survey to give your feedback about this webinar. That way we know where we're doing well and what we need to improve. That's great. Thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate it again. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank so. you for joining us. Yeah. And Beth, please feel free to email us or you can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So or, or yeah. throw a snowball in my direction and I'll, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah, ben has more snow than I do until Monday. So yeah. you, you guys, we're right up at um, 2.30. Um, let's go ahead and have the drawing. Okay. Great. So I've got a random number generator and I select, <laughs> yep, select uh, it, the answer it gives me is five, which means Kathleen, you are the winner. Yay. Yay, Yay. Kathleen. So um, we'll need to get you in touch with Ben so that he can get your physical address. But awesome. yeah. So um, again, um, I think it's, it, it, this has been a jam-packed hour, and we thank. Uh, let's have a big round of applause for our yes. speakers, Ben and Allie. Thank you. Thank you for attending, because otherwise we'd just be talking to ourselves, so. <laughs> as we do, or to each other. But that's okay. Yeah.